Good afternoon slash early evening. You're not being deceived. This is two creative writers. Not only that, it is two directors of the Writers' Centre at Goldsmiths. Past and present. It's like Christmas Carol gone wrong. We'll see what <laughs> we can do about uh, the director of the Goldsmiths Writers' Centre future. Uh, and this is also a sort of delayed leaving party, so it's rather odd to invite somebody back so they can leave, but that's how we're playing it. We're a little bit inventive in our approach to hospitality, so there will be cake and bubbles afterwards. And it is to celebrate the fact that Erica is our first distinguished fellow of the Writers' Centre. There will be others. No one can take that away from you. No one can take it away, and it is a great honour of which I am extremely appreciative. So it's wonderful to be back. So we will celebrate her ascension, if that's the way I'm seeing it later on. Uh, and we're talking about... Someone tweeted ennoblement, which I really love. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. Yeah, okay. Hanging on to it. Okay, okay. Well, it's certainly that late. And we're also celebrating a new book written with the help of the court, uh, Mary and Mr. Elliot, which is about the relationship between Mary Chabelle and T.S. Eliot. Now, the T.S. Eliot I was brought up with, I mean, as a doctor figure rather than just saying at school, was this austere, withdrawn figure but it turns out there were at least four women who were sort of occupying cardinal points. There was the first wife, crazy or not, Vivienne, destabilizing Vivienne. Uh, there was Valerie, absolutely restabilizing Valerie. At the other end. At the other end. Yeah. There was Emily Hale, who somehow ignited a passion that was best uh, fed at a distance somehow. And now taking her place is Mary Trevelyan. What does she bring to the mix? Um, I think Mary is the least known of these four, hopefully now, a bit less least known. Um, but she occupied a, an interesting kind of interregnum period um, in Eliot's life. They met um, in the late 1930s when she invited him to speak at Student Movement House, which was an organization that she ran in London that was for foreign students coming from all over the world to study in London. And she was a really remarkable woman. She was nine years younger than Eliot, um, had never married. The Trevelyan family, like the Eliot family, were a very grand, a grand English family, as much as a grand American family. Her cousin was the historian G.M. Trevelyan, um, and so she was a person who had a sense of having a duty to do good in the world. And in fact, I spoke um, a week or so ago uh, at the International Students' House, which is the organization that she founded. It was, the, it was the sort of culmination of her work at Student Movement House, and it's still on Great Portland Street welcoming students from, from all over the world. So she invited him to come and speak to her students, and he gave a poetry reading um, in 1938. Um, she wrote to him afterwards thanking him, but also rather amazingly um, sending him, mocking his lugubrious reading of The Hollow Men and writing a parody, which she sent him. Um, so she was a bold person. Um, and this was the beginning of a 20-year friendship. And what was interesting about this friendship was it was not romantic. We might come back to that in a moment. But it was very domestic. They had this, what you allude to, is you do see through Mary's account of Eliot, and she left a manuscript, which she called the Pope of Russell Square, which is a mixture of her diary and their correspondence, giving a portrait of this uh, two decade long friendship. They went to church together. They listened to music together. They both loved music. They were both very committed to the Anglican church. Um, they went on long drives together. They cooked sausages together. It did look rather like a comfortable couple, but there was quite a lot going on beneath the surface. But Elliot felt safe with her, I think, in a way that he hadn't until he met Valerie. That may be 
partly because they're educated and intelligent portraits, she was not a literary person as such. Absolutely. I'm, I'm reminded of in his memoir, John Updike gives a list of the categories of people who make him stutter. And men make him stutter more than women. People who are in the literary world make him stutter stutter more than those who don't. So if we assume that there's a sort of spiritual stutter or certainly a huge level of inhibition, it sounds as if she was the right place to bring out a certain confidence from him. Absolutely. And so and I think that was relaxing for him that she wasn't of this world. And you can you can feel this in her account of him because he will allude to people and she really doesn't have any idea who they are and doesn't especially Care. And he would send drafts of work to Emily Hale for Emily Hale to comment on and help him shape, particularly his plays. He never did that with Mary. And she had absolutely no pretensions to be a literary person. That also makes her account, her portrait of him, interesting because it is very different than most people. She comes from a very different angle. On, on the whole, I think she's very generous. There was just a couple of moments of, of photo bitchiness. One was when she's at the theatre watching Rattigan's separate tables with Elliot, and he says, but it's all very well done, but where is it going, he says after F1, and she remarks, not to him, but to herself, rather what they say about your play. And uh, I mean, so she clearly was not intimidated, but tactful. Yes. And she, she, she only rocked the boat when she had to, when she felt she had to. And there was, a, there was also a point, um, was it with, and I think maybe it was after the cocktail party, where she did say directly to him that she felt that his, the characters in his plays were essentially only doing what he told them to do. The thing that surprised me was that he felt they were absolutely from his flesh and blood. He felt, I hadn't realized that he heard voices as he fell to sleep. Uh, and listen to them, and that he regarded the seven people, always seven, that were the basis of his dramas. He felt that they were writing it for him. I, I, that was surprisingly romantic and unbuttoned approach to play writing. And you wouldn't guess it from the... No, no, no. You, you'd think it was much more abstract and mathematical and somehow uh, willed in advance yeah. rather than naturally. Not being, uh, we might play a parlor game called Would You Rather Be Monica Jones to Philip Larkin? Or Marriage of Ellie to T.S. Eliot. Oh, I'd much rather be Marriage of Ellie. Okay. I, I had to choose. Um, Even though she had worse suffering, because what happened was that Marriage of Ellie did have romantic dreams, and she was justified in the extent that Ellie's sister very much wanted assistance, wanted her as a sister-in-law. But she, even when he let her down lightly, as he saw it, she kept needing to be let down less than that. What what stops her from being a pathetic figure? Well, I admire her forthrightness. She, as I say, was nine years younger than Elliot. I think by the time, you know, by the time she met him, she wouldn't have expected in her own life to marry. Um, she proposed to him not once but twice in quite a practical way, sort of saying we should not be, why should we be two lonely old people you know, when we could be together. And they did have this very domestic seeming relationship. Um, and at one, you know, towards the end of their friendship, he made her essentially his medical proxy. Mm -hmm. You know, she would go and talk to his doctors for him. He was always ill. Um, so she had reason. And as you say, his family too, his niece, um, were very well disposed to her. He, Elliot, corresponded with her mother. Um, she proposed to him, he said, I am too damaged from the terrible things in my past, which he was initially very veiled about what these things would be. She didn't really even know Emily Hale's name until quite late on in their friendship. When she proposed to him the second time, he was again, you know, firm that this was never could be a part of their life because it never could be a part of his life. Um, but then it was. Then <clears throat> there was Valerie. I, I know we pride ourselves on giving students uh, a grounding in life's reality. And I, one of the things I learned from this book is that you can pretty, pretty much be sure that somebody who complains about this, the fit of his false teeth does not have a romantic image in her mind. 
And I mean, he didn't mention his files or Veruca, but you know, all those things are signs that he's just not that into them. Yes. But she, she did go on with assuming there was, there was something. She did. Although, again, exactly what the something was, and I always think when we are writing about the past, you know, we always have to be kind of careful of assuming what people in the past would want versus what we would want. And so, you know, hmm. how we define romance or desire is complicated in this context. But absolutely, I think you're right, you know. And he, but she also treated him as her nephew, um, Humphrey Carpenter said she treated everyone. She did treat him like a naughty little boy. So even though she was younger than him, he sometimes, he, ref he would refer to himself as her nephew with a, you know, a sort of pet that name. Um, so the dynamic between them was interesting, but it was it was not sexual. But you can also see why in that time she might have expected a different kind of couple thing. You ask why she's not then a pathetic figure, it's a very good question. Her ability to dust herself off and keep going. She was wounded by him, um, but after they parted, um, spoiler alert, but you know, it's hard to keep away from it, and I think in this academic context we can discuss things fully. Um, she, they parted for Christmas um, in 1956. Have a lovely Christmas. He said he might be going to the south of France. She was going to be going to the Isle of Wight or something. See you next year. She came back and in early January received a postcard that said in the passive voice, Dear Mary, by the time you read this, I, I will have been married to Miss Fletcher. Miss Fletcher, of course, who was 38 years younger than he was. And in their encounters together, he had always been pretty actually dismissive of this young woman who was his secretary. I mean, she was too efficient as a secretary. She was a you know, kind of pain in the ass. Um, this, uh, you know, this, um, this marriage was a shock to pretty much everyone. It wasn't just a shock to, to Mary. But they never saw each other again. She finally did. He there was a kind of awkward correspondence between them, but she really ended the relationship kind of on her own terms. The last correspondence was hers, and she went on and lived a remarkable and indefatigable life. So she's not just defined by this relationship. I, I, I agree that that does come across differently because I think there are questions with respect to mm. the young thing. Uh, not that. Uh, but uh, one thing that, one detail that isn't in the book, but I, I loved when I read it, is that the moment that people at Faber thought, oh, something's going on, is when Valerie started wearing high heels, which nobody else was allowed. And again, this is a bit of word worldly wisdom, not so savory, sometimes stalking works. Because <laughs> she really did. Valerie, uh, her life was changed by hearing Gilgood read the poems. When she was 14. From then on, everything was moving towards the altar that only she could see. And uh, I remember reading that they were very physically demonstrative, but in that strange way of holding hands in public, which she also did with Mary Trevelyan. Uh, and it's, it's, again, it's not something you expect to be part of his physical repertoire, because it is so intimate with an edge of the infantile, if, he, if she's mm. somehow the decision maker and steering him. And there is that very affecting passage where she sees an old man trying to pick up his stick in the street, and more or less looks away to save the embarrassment, and then realizes it's Eddie. So uh, he did need some looking after, and Valerie had certainly appointed herself to do it. Absolutely. Uh, did you lose respect for Eliot in the course of working the book? The question is how much I had in the first place. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how much respect did you have for it? Um, it was, you know, it was one of the reasons that I, so I was approached to write this book. Um, I... Some of you may know I wrote a book called Ariel's Gift, which was published many years ago now about Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. And, um, and 
birthday letters, Ted Hughes's final book of poems, <clears throat> and uh, off the back of this, I was approached by the Trevelyan estate because this manuscript that Mary wrote has been sitting in the body and it's not been a secret. Um, and biographers like Lyndall Gordon have looked at it, um, but it hasn't, had never been brought fully to light, partly because while Valerie was alive, and she only died in 2014, she didn't, she wouldn't allow anything to be mm -hmm. done with it because much of it is Eliot's words, Eliot's letters from their correspondence. Um, so I was asked to, to do this. So I didn't come at it as an Eliot scholar. Um, and of course, transformative poet um, of the 20th century. Um, but I have always struggled um, with his prejudice, um, you know, which is very plain. And it's one of the interesting contrasts between us that although Mary was absolutely a woman of her time, she was incredibly open-minded and really did see, insofar as it was possible to do in those last days of empire, to see all people as equal. And to go and see, and I mean, to, to be in Burma yeah, as it left, absolutely. as it changed its constitution. To travel really all over the world in, in a, and all throughout the African continent, through Asia, um, all through the Americas, really amazing. Um, and in a very clear-eyed and generous way, and he was not you know, generous in that way at all. Um, and it's hard not to think that she was used by him. And I think people were instrumental to him. And the four women that you mentioned, exactly as you laid out, they each served purpose in his life. Um, I don't think he really saw any of them as full human beings, but relationships happen between two people, and I'm, um, <laughs> you can never judge what is going on in a relationship. I thought that when I wrote that about Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. That was where I really came up against that because here was a relationship that people had terrifyingly strong opinions on. Um, were you on her side? Were you on his side? And I don't know, how can we even know what's going on in our own lives? <laughs> sort of from moment to moment. And if all we have is a written record, Actually, the written record isn't very much. Most of our lives, you know, vanish. So manuscripts and archives, I actually think, are very deceptive. They give you the illusion of having some control over the past, but, but you don't. So I'm glad I wasn't Mary Trevelyan. But the thing that fascinated me, I suppose I've written a lot of different kinds of books. What unites them for me is I am fascinated by the stories people tell themselves. So that interested me about this, the story that Mary was telling herself mm -hmm. about this, the story that Eliot was telling himself about their relationship, the stories about their different places in the world. That's what fascinates me always. Um, and yeah, I'm glad I wasn't Mary. One thing that comes across quite strongly is that although they were very much on the same page religiously in terms of denomination and doctrine, they were so different in temperament in a way that she seems not to have noticed that it seems to me that when he confessed, and he was big on confessions, he wallowed in the guilt that he admitted to, but he did not make amends to the person he wronged, whereas she did. Yes. Uh, and it seems extraordinary that they should not have noticed, 
a fundamentally different mechanism. But he would turn up with presents, with nylons, with gin. <laughs> but he, he was not able to continue the relationship with somebody there. It, it, he would he start to, again. He had to just start again. He had to leave that person and start again. She was the opposite of a wallower. And get, you know, again, that made her, when you're writing books, you look for good companions. And she's a doubting companion. You know, if you are feeling sorry for yourself, Mary will say, don't be ridiculous. Have a gin tonic and you'll feel better. You know, it really is her. And I remember mean, sometimes she, she just refuses the letters and just saying, nonsense. Nonsense. And sort of overwrites yes. it with what she feels That's he, right. should, he should be saying. But I, I think artists do often, I think it's Descartes' mo motto is, love artists pro deo, I advance with the mark. And I think Eliot did that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, and to some extent, I think if you, if you, his first published poem could pretty much be known as the love song of J. Alfred Committerfolk. I mean, he was very clearly indicating, it was a very truthful mm. portrait in yeah. a way of somebody absolutely paralyzed by self consciousness. And to use a nice phrase that you quote, somebody in whom shyness had been disciplined into courtesy. So he had good manners over an absolute flinching from intimacy. And when those good manners got him into a position that couldn't extricate himself, he could be brutal. She talks about the sadism that he fights against. Do you think that's fair, both the sadism and the fighting against? Yes. I don't think it was, again, and I, I don't know if I could have taken on the book, I don't think it was intentional sadism. I think she felt it as sadism. Because, again, you know, what would happen is they would be very, they'd have a sort of period of intimacy of seeing each other quite a bit, and then he'd have to have a pause. You know, he'd, he'd say, I, and he'd say, I can't see anyone. I can't see any, you know, I can't see any one person too often. So there was this sort of push pull in their relationship. I don't think he, I don't think he meant to be sadistic, but in a way, well, I'm not in, I'm perfectly glad to say, I don't think I'm an authority, but in a way to be sadistic, you have to be thinking a lot about the other person. <laughs> and he was really always thinking about himself. <laughs> Too selfish to be a sadist. Too selfish to be a sadist. <laughs> Too self-absorbed. But, but the thing that seems extraordinary is that he should have, he should be sharing premises with somebody who became increasingly physically disabled and dependent, and sometimes used him, the disabled man, John Hayward, Hayward. Uh, as a pretext to get out of, to rearrange his life as if it was John making it happen and yet could walk away from that. And it was extraordinary to, to send out strong signals of virtue, because I think that's there's a certain amount of virtue signaling in that, of, of sharing your yeah. life with somebody less fortunate than yourself. And then, then he was as unimportant as Mary, but I mean, he'd done nothing. He'd and done he was the person, I think, the two of them in a way were the most hurt by his scarfering um, with with Valerie as they saw as they saw it, um, and John Hayward was very very hurt by not being let into this secret. Um, but in, you know another fascinating thing about writing this book was thinking about you know the way in which we all to a greater or lesser extent compartmentalize our lives. Eliot was a tremendous compartmentalizer. And so one of the things when, um, after he married Valerie and Mary was reading about him in the press, and she writes about this in her afterwards, and one of the things that shocks her um, is that there were reports of them going dancing together, Valerie and Elliot. And she clearly sees this as this younger woman has sort of ensorcelled them into this uh, this past, you know, this past time that isn't worthy of him. But when he was a young man, he was a wonderful dancer and he loved to dance. And Mary never knew that because he never shared that aspect of his life. So he was returning to something there that he had absorbed in his seriousness. So, you know, Mary thought, um, there's, a, there's a quote from, I'm very pleased to have had a, a quote from Sarah Waters on this book, and the reason that I thought she would like the book is, to me, what distinguishes her novels is 
you only have a piece of the story, often. And then there's this amazing moment of revelation where you see everything and you have it. And Mary thought she had the whole story, mm. but she only had a fraction of the story. Valerie had one sort of happy ending. Uh, is it fair to say that Emily Hale had a sort of hot revenge or a cold revenge that was very effective by giving his letters to the library? Uh, so it's as if she understood that's where he, he could be hurt, was in the words. Yeah. She gave him a good kick in the verbals, uh, as far as that goes. Because, I mean, that was, I mean, that seemed to have blindsided him as much as some of his manoeuvres blindsided the women that he dealt with. Uh, and it's fascinating, uh, it, it reminds me of the fact, I think when, when Gide's wife found that he'd been having sex with men, her re revenge was to burn his letters knowing that she'd only been keeping them for an archive in his eyes. You know, he, he would have a certain sort of letter from her that was part of his dialogue with the world, not anymore, no. Uh, so Emily seems to have, after a lot of... But I, I think her revenge, um, and I think, and she was, her life, I think, was very damaged by Eliot, but, and Linda Gordon, has written a wonderful book, which was published the same day um, as mine, called The Hyacinth Girl, which is about the women in Eliot's life, but largely about the Hale mm. letters. And she was in Princeton when they were open. Um, more than more, he wrote more letters to her, over a thousand letters, than he wrote to anyone else. Um, but when you, you know, when you read them, and the way that he spoke to her, in a sense. I think her revenge, if that's what it was, is appetite, because he wasn't really writing to her. He was creating a portrait of him of himself. I think he was, you know, and he he did talk to her about how these letters should be preserved, mm -hmm. um, which only a certain kind of person, I I would think, I dare say I haven't written that in any of the letters I ever wrote to. To anyone. Um, so, in a sense, what was he expecting? But by that logic, Mary did get more of the real Elliot because uh, the, the warmth, the, the, the coming and disturbing her while she couldn't make him rest. Yes. And also some very confiding moments that don't seem performative when he says how imaginative people suffer from fear of us during the war and how surprised he is that his impersonation of courage isn't questioned, that he can get away with the bluff. Yes. and learn from that. You know, that is not somebody who's admiring the way he's going to be received. So she clearly did get a lot of, of the things that he was hiding from other people. And she kept, you know, there are moments where she says in her manuscript that she's not sharing the conversation because it was a private conversation. And, and to me, that sort of does a double duty. It kind of it does show their intimacy, but it also shows that she wants to demonstrate mm. that intimacy. That this will go no further. This will go no further. He did tell me this kind of thing. I am keeping that confidence. Shall we take some questions? I feel sure they will be remarkably clever. So. <laughs> Don't feel inhibited. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> He's goldsmith. We're entitled to it. Yes, please. Uh, I was wondering what you made of his um, rejection and disapproval of marriage when he said he couldn't be done. Whether he was totally sceptical about the story of his creation and whether, or whether he had some notion of his man's perspective as well, just regarding Valerie coming along with Mary. I, I don't think it was bullshit. Actually. I mean, I think, I think in a way, you know, as Adam was saying, I think he didn't see her that, he didn't see Mary that way. Anyway, but I also think when those proposals came along, which was five years really before he met, you know, it was sort of 1950, and then Valerie comes along in, in that way, in that, you know, saw a few years later. My feeling is that he was still in the throes of his sort of penitence. You know, he was like doing penance for his destructive marriage, for 
discovering that, in fact, he was unable to marry Emily Hale when he kind of thought that he would be. So I don't think it was completely disingenuous, but I just I also just don't think he saw her that way. And then this, there was this lovely young woman, you know, who's, who's every, and also the thing is, it's very difficult, as we all know, um, you know, Elliot was everything to Val. And Elliot was not everything to Mary. And it's actually very difficult to imagine them married because he was, a, I mean, he was, he had ill health, but he was a terrible hypochondriac. He didn't like people. He didn't want to go anywhere. She was indefatigable. It would have been a really odd match. Um, so I think it, I think she, I think he did her a service, actually. I'm, I'm not sure he was a classic hypochondriac. One of the really interesting things that Mary found out as the person who was allowed to ask questions was the doctor saying, he, he's not in any danger of dying, but his tachycardia does feel as yes. if he is dying. You think, well, that, that's good to know. It's good to know that your feeling that you're not dying is not dying, but I'm just, it's, it's not it's any not fun. fun. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I felt that, that that was typical that she should ask the questions, get the answer, pass it on, perhaps gave him some relief. Yeah. And there's always the thing. I mean, she didn't want to be used by him, but she absolutely wanted to be useful. Yes. And, and he was quite able to wear that strand. Other questions? Can I ask a very dumb question? There are no dumb questions. I don't know. This, it, it, As I used Adam, to say Adam I might, might actually <laughs> really just shut this down completely. But I guess, can we go talk about the, why hasn't Elliot actually been cancelled? <laughs> um, because he was a rabid anti-Semite. And in the, we, Larkin has suffered terribly, hasn't he, in the kind of annals of this. But actually, some, and clearly his, he's an egotistical narcissist, isn't he? Um, what, what's going I, on there? I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not the person equipped to answer that question. It does, it does surprise me. I mean, and particularly, you know, the kind of, you know, the Jew squatting on the windowsill stuff is really hard to, to, read. to read. There yeah. it is in the it's, collected poems. And as far as I can tell, nobody seems to mind. Maybe someone here has a better uh, answer than me. People mind, but it is, a, it is enshrined. There, there's a sense where you say it's hard to read specifically about his homophobia. I don't find it hard to read about homophobia uh, at all because the whole reason the legislation was important and the change of social attitudes uh, kicked yeah. into, into life was that people, unbenighted people, had benighted attitudes. Yes. Uh, and so I'm, I'd much rather it wasn't padded away, just as I'd much rather yes. that on Radio 3 uh, they don't uh, censor the word that Langston Hughes, beginning with N, about himself. In a poem to his father and replaced it with black man. I, I think if that was his word, that that's good enough. We shouldn't tidy them up. But do you mean by cancel? Well, I say think like the anti-Semitism is what strikes me that if he'd been using, for example, the N word, and uh, in the way that he talks about Jewish people, he may well have been cancelled. I just feel like that the, the, there is a sort of double I standard. I mean, I, I struggle with the term cancelled, and you know, I will yeah. say, um, but. Um, and I don't want you know cancelling people is not something I yeah it's think not is, something we encourage yeah is it? but, um, but he, he seems to have escaped that kind of um, he does but I but I think it is he is such a titanic cultural figure it would be very difficult so if you're very very tall you can have Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> Get the wine then. <laughs> Shouldn't I? I don't know. <laughs> am I, I jumping the gun? <laughs> I'm, 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 ask the question then. Make yourself useful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening. I'm going to listen. But. Um, it does also seem like it hasn't really done anything to inflict an attack or done this much. Um, it was a really, it was a very interesting book to write because it's not a book I expected to write. I didn't sort of expect to spend time with either of these people. Um, and that was, it, so it was, so it was a challenge, I guess. You, Francis, pointed 
had a good term that you taught me, which is, and this, so this is more about writing, which is productive discomfort. I like that. Um, which is better than misery when you're writing. You can tell yourself that you're in productive discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt quite a lot of this. Um, also because I'm not the scholar of T.S. Eliot, so there were plenty of moments where I had to sort of say to myself, well, they could have found one of those <laughs> if they wanted one of those. They wanted someone to, to tell the story um, in a way that, that, that wasn't scholarly. Mm -hmm. You could have produced a book with a lot of footnotes and annotations. And, and I, I really wanted to show Mary's side. When you first looked at the material, was there a point where you thought, yes, I'm on board with this? Oh, so right away. Because, and what I, one thing I will say is Mary is a wonderful writer. And she, she really has a vivid, engaging style and completely forthright. You know, it's not beautiful. It's not embellished. It's not poetic. She wrote two books of her own. Um, uh, w the first one was about her work with students, um, foreign foreign students, um, and then. Um, but this, the second book, which was published just after the war, is called "I'll Walk Beside You," and it is a collection of letters. I forget, like sixteen or eighteen long letters that are they were written to Eliot, but he's not named. Um, in the in the correspondence, but in the very at the very end of the war, she went with the YMCA um, into Europe to to Brussels. Mainly, she was based in Brussels, um, and they took over a hotel in Brussels, the Albert the um, First, to make um, a place of respite for the Allied soldiers who were kind of cleaning up a destroyed Europe at that point. So the soldiers would come back um, from the borders of Germany and France and have two days of wholesome rest and recreation in this hotel before going back to what they had to do. But she also traveled a bit around Europe and indeed into Germany. Um, and Again, I'm, I'm not a scholar of the Second World War, but I've read quite a lot about the Second World War and quite a lot of first-hand accounts. And her portrait of this particular time and particular place is really extraordinary. This, I think, I mean, you know, publishing business being what it is, but I think this is a book that deserves re republication. It's very slim. Um, it's, it's a really riveting account. It's worth reading for its own sake. I quote quite a bit of it, um, but it's marvelous. Interestingly, um, Eliot first discouraged her from writing it um, because he didn't. She was said she was thinking of doing a book um, in of these letters in epistolary form, and he said he had a sort of blanket disapproval of epistolary books because he said um, they have too much of the personality touch, <laughs> which he disapproved of. But she carried on, but he then turned it down. So it was published, her first book was published by Faber, which he published as he was the director, but this book was published by Longreach because he didn't accept it. His loss. Not quite as bad, um, you know, a, a gash as turning down Animal Farm, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. Did, by the end of this, did you find you had any sympathy for Eliot, or did you feel completely Oh, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. If, I mean, because I guess, I don't want to be a Pollyanna, um, but, and there are exceptions in the world, right? But mostly, I think, people who are unkind or difficult. I have a lot of compassion for Eliot. I mean, I think he suffered as much as 
anybody else around him. He was very hard on himself. Um, I'm glad he seems to have found happiness, you know, at, at the end of his life. So absolutely, I, I, I don't think like his life was a picnic and, and everyone else's was a misery. I, I also think it's very difficult for us to imagine now, even including pop stars, people like Beyonce, like the degree of his fame as a cultural figure, there's no one, because, because our cultural world is so fragmented now, but in the Western world, there was no one like him. And I thought about how kind of stultifying that would be. And I think it really, I think it really was. So yes, I do. I do. Chaplin's fame was greater, but he could just remove the crease paint from right. and disappear. Yes. And Elliot had to, had to uh, there's a story I think of his visiting Wyndham Lewis on his deathbed. And Wyndham Lewis says, he doesn't get in here disguised as Westminster Abbey. <laughs> And I was interested by the stuff about pounds. I hadn't yes. realized that there was so little fellow feeling for pounds or the sense of duty in visiting pound when he was in prison after making broadcasts that were not so very different from the things that one might assume Elliot had, yeah. had, uh, had a certain amount of share there with Rodgold Brown, but there was a, there's a sort of dry pity for him. Well, and I think that. he was always, he knew, um, and, and Matthew Hollis in his new book about the, the, about the Wasteland, which has just come out, is wonderful on this, um, of exactly why Elliot felt all his life indebted to Ezra Pound, however kind of crazy and vehemently anti-Semitic and fascistic Ezra Pound was, uh, became. Um, Elliot was always loyal to him. But he was able to discount the contribution made to his early career by drinking. That, that seems to have been, he seems to have yes. had no sense of, of obligation there. Indeed. Although maybe he did for someone else. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> yes. Can I just ask a few questions about what it was like to write it? It was really interesting to hear about the productive discomfort, but how long did it take? And was there a lot of. Um, input or did you have kind of free reign and I'm also just really interested in who chose the title it's I chose the title right so it's my title yeah. um, and um, it took it was going to take two years and then I got a job at Goldsmiths <laughs> <laughs> so it took five years <laughs> um, and what yeah when I so when I took it on I you know I had like all I was doing was writing and then I was here and I was teaching. Um, and also, as with other books I've done, it took longer because I was scared of, you know, to find other things to, to do. Um, and even though I told myself I've done other things and been scared of them and succeeded, and it doesn't help the next time somehow, amazingly. Um, so, um, what I did, the sort of way that I did it was, is Mary's manuscript, this account that she left, which was a mix of their letters and her diaries, and it's chronological like the book is, um, is 130,000 words, which is quite long. Chief, Chief Engineer, my book about the book, that, that's about 130,000 words. So this, you know, this book is 90,000 words altogether which is about how long as I wanted it to be. So the first thing I had to do, the way that I did it, was I kind of went through the manuscript, picking the, the structure, the best bits, leaving out pages and pages of debate between them about the fate of the church in South India <laughs> that I thought would be of limited interest. <laughs> To other people, I, and my, you know, could make it's an important subject. Make a scholarly paper, not for my book. So, what I so I then had, I think I took about 50, 50 or sixty thousand words, fifty thousand words, of Mary's manuscript, and then I worked 
around that. Um, I didn't have a huge amount of, I mean, I had just, you know, I had a lot of discussions with my editors and particularly with, in the early stages with Jill Coley, who was the agent at Rogers College and White is now retired, but she kind of took the project on and she was, she's wonderful, she's now retired. Um, she was the agent for the Trevelyan estate, right? Um, and she was very helpful to me in thinking about the book in the, in the early stages. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, that's, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. So can you explain the title of the book? Oh, um, I really like the, it. sort of why it's Mary and Mr. Elliot? Yeah. I think that seemed to express to me the distance between them that she didn't quite see. I mean, she didn't call him Mr. Elliot, she called him Tom, quite right too. But she didn't have the picture of, of what was going on and the kind of difference in their status. And, sta you know, as he saw it. Um, she was in service to him. She put herself in service to him. So that's where that came from. Um, and then the subtitle was mine too. And we had a lot of interesting kind of discussion. Because I do, I do think, first of all, there's many kinds of love stories. You know, love is not always romantic. Um, I also think one of the jobs of a title you know, it can be to make people a bit curious. So like, what, a sort of love story? What's that? I hope people ask. And perhaps I will. But it also expresses that, I think, his love for Melody is clinging to his Yes, that's right, yes. He, and her lack of interest. And her lack of informality. Yeah, absolutely. Barry, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And Mary, Mary and Tom were the sons of Peter and Mrs. Mary. Exactly, that's right, yeah. Um, but they weren't. They weren't Mary and Tom, you know, although they, they were in there. Um, but he did always have this formality. And yes, that would have then been too much of play on something else, somebody else's work. Do you want me? Do you think we should explore the process while well it's <laughs> I just suddenly had a thought that it reminds me of an Ishiguru kind of novel, doesn't it? That like um, remains of you. the day it has this quality, doesn't it? That you are with this character who's self-deluding and then this kind of moment of realisation, which she never quite achieves, does she? Mm. But um, it has that, that sort yes, of, she has that like kind that. of quality of, of Stevens, the butler. In it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'd like to thank Eric O'Reilly. Okay, well, if you'd like to go That's always a bit of an alarming question. Not in this case. I will never say this again. Please use your phone to commemorate.